Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for um, helping me um, attempt to get there. I have evidence of my test here, which I took, and I was very much looking forward to being there. Um, things happened. I, I will be there soon next time at some point. Um, it's, um, it has always been a pleasure to be in Vilnius, and I look forward to being there um, again. Um, we are short of time, so I will um, I will skip over the the niceties, and I will get down to the to the topic of what I wanted to um, what I wanted to discuss today. As we mentioned earlier, um, I'm here to talk about financial crime, uh, and I'm here to talk in particular about what financial crime does or is likely to do um, to um, to the fintech um, to the fintech world. Um, before I start, I thought I should introduce myself and, um, and what I do. Um, the short version of what I do is that I fight criminals and I fly planes. Uh, both things are true, but I, perhaps I should give a little bit more context. Um, I run a practice that does two things. Um, on one hand, um, it works with the banks, with the financial institutions, um, helping the financial institutions build um, their systems and their controls to protect themselves from financial crime. Um, on the other hand, I do something that is quite unique. Um, I work with regulators and enforcement agencies, um, with people like the FBI, the DOJ, but also the various financial intelligence units in Europe, um, investigating financial crime. Um, I have, amongst other things, investigated the Swedbank related case, um, various um, Latvian and Lithuanian cases, Vatican corruption, um, and I spend a lot of my time in Malta um, investigating and looking after um, the concerns of which you are possibly um, already aware. Um, wherever there are large cases of corruption and, um, and man laundering, by and large, um, my team um, is, is there or thereabouts. Um, the reason why I say these things is that because um, what this has given me has been the opportunity to look at what actually makes financial crime happen. Um, there are, um, you know, financial crime, money laundering, terrorist financing um, makes headlines. We keep hearing about um, the um, we keep hearing about the the, the, the biggest scandals, the the laundromat. Um, we hear that there has been you know four billion, five billion worth of money that's passed through the system. Um, financial crime is a huge problem in today's society. However, what really um, what really means something is that um, it is very small things um, that enable um, this type of financial crime to happen. Very small oversights. Um, and what I wanted to do today in particular, I wanted to talk about how um, for fintechs in particular, not just for the, for the big banks, um, those small things um, can create um, a huge risk, but also perhaps as to how there is an opportunity for fintechs um, to utilize um, their smaller size, their linear outfits um, to, um, to their advantage. So let me tell you, um, whenever I speak to, um, to individuals, to firms that operate in the, in the fintech world, um, I hear a lot of, oh God, but we are so small, we are, uh, we are nothing uh, compared to a Barclays, compared to a Swedbank, compared to a Danske. Are we really um, going to be used and abused um, as a vehicle of, um, for financial crime? And the reality is that, yes, you are. Um, let me explain for a moment how financial crime simply happens. Um, let's imagine, it, this is an oversimplification, but we have a jurisdiction, we have a place in the world where dirty money is made. 
Um, this is made by way of corruption, mostly. I know that if you look at the statistics online, if they tell you that one of the biggest drivers of money laundering and financial crime in the world is um, um, tax evasion. It's not true. In my experience, the biggest driver of financial crime today is corruption. It is just that we are, as a world, we are not ready to recognize corruption um, as a driver of financial crime. In any case, we have a jurisdiction in which financial crime, uh, um, illicit money is made. Um, let's call it Azerbaijan. I apologize if there is anyone in this in this room, virtual and uh, live from Azerbaijan. There's no, uh, there's no real, uh, th th there's no, con there's no particular driver for that. There, are, there is a lot of um, Azerbaijani dirty money in the system right now. Let's call this country. Um, country A, where dirty money has been made. Um, if I have made four or five million in dirty money, I need to spend it somewhere. I don't want to spend it all in Azerbaijan. There, is, there are very limited amount of things I can do and buy in Azerbaijan with, uh, with that money. Um, I need to take it out somewhere else. Um, mostly in jurisdictions like the UK, London, property, luxury goods, cars, watches, art. These are all the, the things and therefore the places where the money comes out. However, if I go with that bag of money to a bank, to a main bank, um, that bank um, in London will typically ask me a lot of questions. Where I've made this money, how I've made it, why I'm making so much money, um, and things like that. Those are the typical KYC questions. Um, so I need somewhere to take money from the country where I've made it to the country where I want to use it. Um, and as I said, I can go through the big banks. I can go through the mainstream of financial services and I will go. But what is happening is that uh, the mainstream financial services is becoming more and more probing, is asking more and more questions. So as a criminal, I need to start looking for other channels, channels where perhaps I'm asked fewer questions. Um, I'll take you to, uh, to the other one in a moment. Um, that channel where fewer questions are asked tends to be, right now, um, the world of fintechs. And that is not because fintechs are stupid or willingly trying to help criminals, but simply because fintechs are typically smaller outfits, generally startups with fewer people um, who obviously say, you know, I have literally just started up. How can I buy so many compliance people and put in place um, these types of controls that are really expensive. Um, and I understand that argument. What happens though, is that criminals also know that that is the case and they actively exploit um, the network of fintechs. And that is where I take you to this picture. This is a real picture um, from an investigation that we have conducted recently. Um, that this investigation is um, something that was primarily um, centered around, um, around fintechs. All the, all the connections that you see there is something, it, it's a touch point with a fintech around the world. These are all small payment institutions that were being used to send criminal money around the world. Um, so this tells us that in reality, um, there is a parallel um, universe of um, a parallel universe of, of a shadow banking system that criminals have always, always used. This, this shadow banking economy has existed forever. But now with the world of fintechs, we are enabling it. Uh, we are enabling yet another layer of this, this parallel world. And I'm here to say not, let's not go there. Absolutely, let's go there because technology, innovation, um, moving towards the future is, is important, but let's do so in a controlled manner. 
And it is possible to mitigate the risk. How, you will ask me, with due diligence, which means much more than obtaining a copy of a passport, with strong transaction monitoring, and with skills and knowledge, because there is no system anyone will ever buy um, that will prevent um, anything, any bad thing from happening. You need intelligent people, experienced people who can actually look through the system. Um, you need a framework of controls, um, but also we must remember that being capable of doing this does not necessarily mean a bad thing. It means also an opportunity for fintechs um, to, um, to become and to go into a space where banks cannot perhaps get um, immediately. Bigger banks have a bigger legacy to have to adjust and to have to, um, to transform. Um, I could be here talking for the rest of the day on this topic because um, it's, it's what I do and it's what I'm passionate about. Um, but I'm being told regularly um, that, the, um, that my time is up. Um, the thing I wanted to say, um, however, is that um, I, um, I, I often hear um, that we shouldn't worry so much about financial crime um, because financial crime is actually um, without victims. Um, and it's not true. One thing I mention very often is the fact that um, when I was a child, um, I'm originally from Sicily, although I've lived in the UK for um, the biggest part of my life, the largest part of my life. When I was a child in Sicily, uh, my house was burned down by the mafia. And I know for a fact that financial crime, it's not a victimless crime. And therefore, um, everyone who plays in the uh, financial services ecosystem has a responsibility and a duty um, to prevent it and the ability to do so. Um, on that beautiful note, I leave you um, and I am here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you.